Hey golfers, and welcome back to the Second Swing Golf YouTube channel. Today, we have a very special live stream and live interview for you. Um, unfortunately, from here where we are in Minnesota, we got a bunch of snow dumped on us, so we're staying inside today, but uh, we still have some great golf content for you coming your way. And joining today, we have a very special guest. It is Sam Hahn. Sam Hahn is the CEO of Lab Golf. So, uh, Sam, first of all, thank you for taking the time today to join us. Um, Give, give the people a rundown of who you are and what Lab Golf is, huh? Um, well, as aforementioned, my name is Sam Hahn. I'm the CEO at Lab Golf. And Lab Golf, uh, we make the finest putters in the world. Um, we have a technology that we call Lie Angle Balance, um, which allows putters to um, effectively just stay square by themselves throughout the stroke. I like that. That's I love how you put that so simply uh, because that's ultimately – what you're trying to do as a golfer, right? On the, on the greens, you're trying to keep that club face square and make more putts. And so that's what, that's what you guys do is what it sounds like. That's it. It's very, very, very simple. And, uh, as we get out into the world more and more and people sort of challenge this idea of, you know, how a putter is supposed to work and what it's supposed to do in motion. Um, you know, my intention is always to kind of bring everybody back to the simplicity, which is and this hand is a putter that stays square by itself. And then this one is one that doesn't, it's not a complicated choice. Sure. Right. Exactly. And I think what's um, kind of drawn people, at least drawn the attention to lab golf, at least part of it, right. Obviously besides the performance and, you know, we'll talk about some of the tour validity that you guys have seen as well. Uh, but kind of the, the unique look of, of the lab putters um, that they're, you know, I don't want to say quote unquote traditional putters have a, a different look than sort of lab does, but clearly there's a, there's a little bit of a difference there visually. Um, and I mean, from your perspective, is that something that were you guys trying to be unique in that, or is that kind of just the result of the technology and sort of the design that, um, goes into the lab putters? So a little of both, um, the directed force, which is kind of our, our flagship model and the one that, that sort of put us on the map was, uh, designed before I came along. So in, uh, in talking to Bill Pressey, the inventor um, and the designer of the DF 2.1, you know, I've, I've talked about what, what that process was like. And it was way more, uh, you know, the, 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 the physical properties required to get a putter to balance are complicated. Um, and so, uh, you know, you got to, if you move weight here, you got to move some more over here. And then you got to take some away from over here. And it's this, you know, kind of crazy whack-a-mole process. And so... <laughs> While sure, it would have been great if it was, you know, driven by aesthetics, it simply couldn't be. And so, um, you know, if you look at the, the the sort of the history of the prototypes that led to the, the DF 2.1, knowing what I know about how to balance these things, I understood why they started where they did and how it progressed the way it did. And then, yeah, it ended up looking really, really funny. Um, the DF 2.1 is, uh, you can see it from two fairways over, and it's unmistakable <laughs> as to what it is. And... Um, in my own personal experience with seeing something so absurd, being totally adverse to using something so absurd, and then in such a short amount of time, being so all in on it that it started to look beautiful, um, I, you know, that I, I wanted the, 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 I realized that our mission was to sort of provide that experience for everybody who was willing to give it a try um, so that we could all remember that aesthetics are totally subjective. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we stay completely present with the fact that Karsten Solheim, founder of Ping, sat on the side of PGA Tour putting greens for two years with everybody in the world telling him that was the ugliest thing they'd ever seen. They would never be caught dead using it. It looks ridiculous. And lo and behold, 60 plus years later, it's the standard of beauty. So right. um, as one of our ads said a few years ago, um, beauty is what makes the ball go in the hole. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Cause it's, yeah, it's definitely something I remember even, you know, obviously the, the popularity of your brand has kind of really grown the last couple of years, but I remember, you know, even four or five years ago, there might be some, some lab putters that may have trickled in and in, in trade and whatnot into second swing. And I would kind of look at that and it's, it is, it's true. It would definitely catch your attention, as you said, from two fairways over. Um, but sort of now to kind of hear the process that goes into that. And it's not some mistake that the putter looks the way it does um so right. now kind of you mentioned some of the different models so i kind of want to let you just run through the i guess the, the lineup of of lab putters here we'll talk about a couple specific models but um 
let kind of run through the mo- the the different models that are uh, available here uh, and and the varying characteristics of them. Yeah, there's a there's there's a, a, a short enough history of our things. I'll just go through kind of chronologically okay. how it all went. Um, so the the first was the directed uh, or actually the company before I came along was called Directed Force, and that particular model was called the Reno. Um, so Reno okay. one. Um, all the way through uh, Directed Force 2.1, all physically look the same. They, you know, there was there was manufacturing changes made over the course of the those four years since um, the inception of that shape. Uh, it used to be forged, now it's machined. Um, we've moved some weights around to make it so that we can make them a little faster and a little bit more accurately and target swing weights, which we didn't used to be able to do. Um, and uh, so that chassis, I mean, really educated us as much as anything mm-hmm. on how to you know best make these things and what you know what we'd want for future designs the next one uh was uh blade one and blade one went 180 degrees exactly the opposite direction it was uh, a, a totally frankly oversimplified blade um the uh, blade one was uh, initially available in brass only um it was intended to be sort of an homage to the the original bullseyes um, and it looked, I mean, literally like a brass rectangle on a stick. I mean, it looked incredibly simplistic and, um, and it's funny because it was actually our most complicated putter, that one. And then the, uh, um, uh, the next one to come was, uh, um, it's the, the, the B2, um, which was even more simple and more pared down and less contours and, and more industrial looking um and people you know often ask us why we stopped making that one and it's because it was just so difficult to balance the smaller the chassis the thinner um the putter head um the harder they are to balance sure. um so uh, so yeah so it went uh, directed for us blade one b2 um and the next one was mez one um and that was a big deal and took a long time and we um we knew we needed to branch out and we had a, you know it was a very very small company at this point i think we probably had six to eight employees, something like that. Um, and uh, we actually hired a designer named John Burquist. Um, he was uh, industry vet and worked with Rife, STX. Um, uh, and he and I worked together to, to design uh, Mez One. And uh, that was a big deal for us. It was the first kind of multi-piece, um, multi-material um, putter we'd ever made. Sure. Um, the manufacturing process was quite different. Um, you know, had to make some tough decisions on, uh, you know, what it was going to look like and kind of towing the line between wanting to find something that everybody had been asking for, you know, something more traditional looking, but um, still, you know, weird enough to be a lab. Um, <laughs> and uh, John Hart nailed it with that aesthetic on that one. Um, and then uh, at this point, we'd had a, we had a nice relationship with Adam Scott and um, he wanted a, a broomstick um in that mez but it was uh, it was too small to hold enough weight and then visually kind of too small to be at the end of a 45 inch shaft so mm-hmm. um kevin martin uh is our uh our in-house guy the engineer um and he retooled it um to come up with the broomstick version um of the mez one and then it was liam bedford who's now currently our tour rep uh who just for fun built out a, a conventional length version with the broomstick head on it and it was awesome and yeah. uh so we called so that that's what kind of gave birth to the whole mez max line the, there was never an intention around the the max head being anything other than a broomstick um but it was just so good on a conventional putter that we that we went with sure. it. um and that's definitely been our best seller over the last couple of years um and then just recently <clears throat> Um, in January, we released the DF3. Um, since inception, everybody's appreciated the technology, maybe sort of got used to the basic um, proportions and shape of the DF2.1, but it's a monster. And so people have been asking us, you know, can you just shrink it down a little bit? So uh, we shrunk it down a little bit um, uh, and, you know, sort of tweak some of the basic design language there um, and uh, also added a ball scoop, which people have been uh begging for these last uh six years and uh uh and there we have it that's all that's all of them 
Well, yeah, that's it's quite a lineup, and it's kind of cool to hear just a little bit, you know, the sort of the basics of of the the history of each model. Oh, the link, of course, yeah, yeah. Go with the, what, what's the story behind the link? Um, well, yeah, after we after we we just continued the B two for manufacturing reasons. Um, uh, people to ask, you know, the same, which, you know, mo mostly we just listen to the customers. It's not tough. I mean, we, we spend so much time on social media that it's very easy for us to get real time mm -hmm. feedback. Um, and everybody, everybody wants an answer. You know, it's a, it's a, it's just an easy shape to get behind. Everybody that's ever played golf has probably had some form of an answer style putter. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so Kevin and myself uh, went to work to, um, figure out a way to balance them um, and still kind of keep that traditional shape. It's a little rugged, you know, with that uh, hosel just kind of bolted to the back and, um, but it's necessary um, for us to be able to balance them and uh, locate the shaft where we need to. Um, uh, and we had some fun with it. Um, you know, the screws all over it. Uh, I think those who probably don't know about our process may think that they're intended for just some visual fun, but they're not, they're necessary. Um, and uh, and like I said before, the link is a challenge. You know, the link is um, definitely takes the most time to balance. We have the most, you know, kind of fallout with it. Um, they're very, very finicky and difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. But um, it's an awesome putter if you're a if you're a blade guy. Um, it'll be the most stable and most forgiving of that style of putter you'll find anywhere. Yeah, I, I like that. There is the different. You know, there's a there's a blade putter in the lab family for someone that you know might be stuck on sort of that visual right that that kind of smaller compact visual you still have the technology there offered in the link model so um, i wanted to kind of dive in now to the some of the tour use and sort of the popularity there and just a quick reminder too for maybe the viewers jumping in and, and watching us on youtube uh, feel free to throw some questions and some comments in there we're going to spend some time at the end here with sam and, and dive into a couple questions from the viewers but um on tour it's really grown over the last couple of years. Um, you know, I think you mentioned Adam Scott. He was kind of the first to um, kind of really take, it seems like, you know, one of the first big names to take the lab uh, brand to tour. And then you've seen the wills out, Taurus, Lucas Glover, some other big names uh, using the Bez Max. And you've also seen other models as well out there. So um, is that is that kind of strive, like, is that popularity, you know, has it really pushed you guys to a new level? Do you feel like there's more awareness out there? Oh, of course. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, of course. The the so we had an experience with Adam um, back in 2019. So when he first got turned on to the tech, he was actually using a conventional version of the directed force, um, mm -hmm. and uh, he played really well with it. Uh, he used it for kind of I think late February through. Um, through the Zurich, um, I think it was, and um, and putted well. He was leading the Masters for two days, um, and this is when we were a teeny tiny little company. I mean, yeah, just very very small company. And uh, he was leading the Masters for two days, and orders are coming in, and the phone's blowing up, and it's just absolute pandemonium. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he ended up uh, missing a, a very very short putt on the 16th hole on Saturday. Um, and they, you know, got the cameras right in on the putter and the whole thing. And all of a sudden crickets, like the, the, the faucet just shut off, phone stopped ringing, order stopped coming in. Um, and at that point we realized that we needed to not rely on the tour, um, sure. to, to kind of push the company forward. So we really started gearing, um, our marketing dollars and, and our efforts towards you and me, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and every other golfer in the world that wants to make a few more putts. And I sure. think that that really helped sort of uh, spread the word that 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 sort of strategy, you know, really helped so that by the time it did actually hit the tour in a, in a significant way, um, people already knew about it. Um, they've been seeing the ads and seeing the stuff. And then now, bam, it's validated on tour. Um, and yes, I mean, it, it definitely took us to, to new heights for sure. Sure. Yeah, I think, I mean, you've clearly seen the success with these guys, too. I mean, even... Earlier this year, Zalatoris has had a really couple of nice finishes there, putting really well. And then even last year, I think what was a, a big one for you guys as well was Lucas Glover winning back to back. Um, and so let's kind of dive into that 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 Mez Max, um, the broomstick model a little bit. And and you ta you talked about some of the tech and how it came to fruition um, about kind of that design. But is there 
I, I'm curious on uh, the actual setup of it because you see these guys they kind of have you know the elbow out and stuff. Is there a, a is there one way to to sort of grip and set up this thing, or is there a couple of different tweaks you can make, or or what's the what's the go to setup for these guys? Uh, I mean, the, a, a lot of the tour guys definitely. Um, just as with the golf swing, when you look at Adam Scott's putting stroke, if you can get rid of all your stigmas around broomstick and whatever, like the stroke is beautiful and his setup mm -hmm. is stunning and it's so symmetrical and he looks all framed up and he looks strong. Um, so I think he's influencing a lot of these guys. <laughs> um, and I put him sort of at the extreme end of the, the framed up spectrum. So um, Adam is about 6'2". That putter's 45 inches. Um, interestingly, and those of you out there thinking about a broomstick, don't do this, um, but his lie is a little flatter. It's at 78 degrees. Um, uh, you should get maximum upright at 79.5 if you're thinking. Um, and he's got the putter kind of out in front of him a little bit and really drives the whole stroke with his back and with his core. At the other end of the spectrum, um, uh, you've got Bernhard Langer. Bernhard's about five foot eight, um, and he uses a 47 inch putter. And he stands virtually straight up um, mm -hmm. and very little movement in his shoulders at all. And the whole stroke is sort of driven by the right arm. Um, and then everybody else is kind of somewhere in between. Um, Will is doing it in a, you know, very, very similar to Adam where he's being very, very deliberate with the big muscles and all that. Um, Lucas is a little bit more in between, even though he's bent over quite a bit. Um, the driving force is a little bit more right arm. Charles Schwartzel, same thing where... Um, maybe he looks a little bit more framed up than he actually is because he's really he's really moving it with his right hand. I personally am more of that style. I like the longer ones. I like standing up sure. um, and sort of just feeling like I'm, you know, just pushing the ball with my right hand. Um, but there's no right way to do it. And it's so cool that all of a sudden there's thousands and thousands of new broomstick users out there that, um, you know, with the exception of this select few that used to use it on tour, um, nobody did therefore there was no curriculum there was no you know thoughts instruction paths that to help people kind of get these things dialed in and all of a sudden there is now um mm -hmm. and people you know on youtube and instagram and everything are sharing their tips as they learn how to dial these things in and i think lucas's experience um allowed people to be a bit more brave um right and, and give it a give it an extra second like when we first started showing up on tour with broomsticks Guys would grab it just for, you know, just to have a laugh. And they they take it back and it's you yeah. know, the first two swings you take with a broomstick are very, very awkward. And you know, the head falls to the inside because it's so heavy and um and all that. And then that would be it. And then they'd put it back in the bag. Now they'll they'll take the time to figure it out for 10 minutes, and that's all it takes, you know, to figure out your mode of how you're gonna move it. Um, and they're finding incredible success. And so um yeah, there's no right way to do it, just like with conventional putting. I mean, look at the million different ways people stand, hold it, you know, all the stuff. It's no different. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, but it's fun. To, it's fun to listen now to people's experiences. Yeah, totally. That's it, it. It's been it's been fun to see the the popularity of of different styles of putting, and obviously the broomstick being one of them, sort of grow here. Because I guess I would categorize myself as one of those players that um, putting has been my my weakness and sort of the thing holding me back. And so, um, you know, one, one of our what fitters kind of actually said to me. So I had been using uh, the Ping Harwood um, model. It's sort of that big mallet, uh, but I'm very much, Work, uh, very much open much to uh, something new in 2024 here. So uh, I've been toying with the the, the cruiser line from Odyssey. Um, so we'll see. I, I have I have some open ended uh, thoughts on that uh, that I need to get solidified here, and I'd have some time because it snowed overnight here. So not gonna be playing golf anytime soon. But um, sure. it's. Uh, it's it's true though like there all these different setups it's uh it's really cool to see it and the fitters have said that you know there's a ton of interest um and especially in the broomstick here so um i wanted to ask too about like the maybe a, i don't you, you've mentioned the word stigma um uh, maybe it's a concern uh, uh, about these longer putters broomstick putters and distance control and i know you've thought about this obviously in in the design of them but what can you say about the broomstick model, uh, the Mez Max, and sort of how it can help golfers with distance control. Because I think maybe in the past, uh, with either the belly putters or the, the anchored styles, like the maybe the concern golfers had was they had less distance control or not as good on the distance control. There's, but how do these help with that? Zero, zero validity. I think that, like, frankly, broadcasters just 
maybe feel like they need to have something to say. And so <laughs> um, they just, somebody said like, oh, well, it's different. Therefore, touch must be difficult, you know, and like, but I, I mean, I, no joke at all. When I see people switch to broomstick, that's literally the first thing that improves is their distance mm. control. Um, there's no, there's no connection. There's no correlation between using a broomstick and somebody's ability to control speed or not. Um, it's definitely different. So yeah, first 20 mm -hmm. minutes, of course, it's going to, you know, different to figure <laughs> right. out how to move a 45 inch putter with a 500 gram head on it versus a 36 inch putter with a 380 gram head on it. But, um, what I see happen, um, is that these things are so big and so heavy that people naturally start to um, steer themselves towards using gravity to control speed, using the length of their stroke to control the speed. Gravity never changes. People's rates of acceleration and their grip pressure and these things, they change every day. If you're using acceleration to control speed, right. that's going to be more inconsistent unless you're like the pros and calibrate every day and you know do all the stuff. So um, no, I don't, I don't see any, um, any correlation between people struggling with broomstick and, on, on speed and if anything, quite the opposite. I think it's a much right. more, um, you could make an argument that it is a much more natural motion and relates more to other sort of stroke motions we make like bowling or throwing a ball or throwing mm -hmm. a dart or free throw. Um, you're just kind of rolling it. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's you're definitely right in that that term natural. It's a much more natural motion, and you're not you're manipulating your the whole thing a lot less yourself, and kind of just letting Correct. the the golf club, the putter, uh, do the work there. So we're getting uh, a couple of nice comments. I wanted to share one with you uh, on YouTube here. This person said, "Sam, thank you." And Lab, I've never owned a putter as tremendous as the two point one. I used to hate putting, knees shaking over three footers. Since changing over to 2.1, my putt stats are light years better. Uh, so I, I had, I couldn't let that one slide without uh, mentioning it to you as, as we go forward here. But um, me too, man. I mean, and, and we <laughs> we get it. I'm not saying this just to. Uh, we see that every day, um, and it is the thing that makes us excited about coming to work every day because it's 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 so real, and putting is so frustrating. It can be so, so, so frustrating. It can just ruin a day to be able to cover 500 yards and two shots and end up six feet away and take a five. I mean, it's just the <laughs> worst thing in the world. And um, uh, and making putts, it, you know, kind of flipping that around, you can be spraying the ball all over the place. But if you can confidently make a 10-footer, golf gets so fun so mm -hmm. quickly. And... Um, and I mean, the, the, the technology continues to blow my mind every single day. And what I see with our customers, it blows my mind every single day. And I'm, um, I love those comments. And thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. It makes us all so happy to hear that. Yeah, I, I could not move forward here with the rest of this without mentioning that because that was a really good one. And, and I'm, you know, I, I having that kind of refreshing feeling, of, you know, with the putter has to be awesome. So um, and kind of on that note, I wanted to transition sort of from tour use to, to amateur use and um, the difference in, in sort of that transition of adding it to the bag, or maybe there's not a difference because um, I kind of wanted to simply just get your perspective on the benefits that amateurs are going to see in the bag versus maybe tour pros. Is there a difference there? Um, it, you know, it, is that transition more seamless? Is it maybe a little bit more difficult for amateurs? Um, what should they expect, um, you know, the amateur players that are going to uh, throw a lab putter in the bag? Yeah, so like you know, like anything in golf and like any piece of equipment, there's no law. Um, there's no you know, 100% reality to people's experiences to getting them dialed in. But I will say what we see um, uh, is surprises some. Generally speaking, and again, not always, but generally speaking, the better the player, the harder it is for them to utilize the lab technology because a better player what they've done is they've geared their stroke their grip their posture their movement their grip pressure all of these things around managing torque and so when you take the torque away um for them who are you know hyper aware of every little motion and every little torque that they're feeling in their hands sure the putter starts to feel very vague um and uh they just kind of get lost in in no man's land there um Whereas with amateurs, I have it in my head that most people 
who don't obsess about golf every day the way that I do or that, you know, a lot of industry folks might, but the people who play, you know, one to five times a month that just want to, you know, go have a good time with their buddies. I think they're already under the impression that their putters stay square by themselves. And so, like, I, I know that I remember, like, kind of back in the day when I used to have a bad day putting, I'd go to the putting green and I'd be like, okay, if I just stay completely neutral and don't move my hands and don't do anything, the putter should just come back the way that I started. And um, I didn't really consider that the putter was actually twisting and moving around. Um, and so kind of back to what we were saying about broomstick, even with the conventional version of our putter, it's a more natural way to think about rolling a ball to a target, you know, like there's no other, you know, kind of going back to these stroke sports, like a, a, a dart doesn't have the lopsided weight that you have to manage. Um, a basketball doesn't right. have a weight on one side of the ball that you have to manage. You know, we connect with our target. We use our, our you know, supercomputer right dominant hand, whatever it is, and we react to the target. Um, golf is so difficult because we have, you know, this barrier between the, 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 our, our brain and the target, which is this unruly instrument. So um, mm -hmm. lab sort of kind of allows people to react in a more natural way, particularly those who haven't spent ungodly amounts of hours dialing in a stroke based on managing a face. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, that's a great point. Again, it, it goes back to this idea that you know the 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 lab putters just make the putting stroke more natural and so um you know like you mentioned a, a better player you know someone that's close to like tour level is so comfortable and and used to what they've got and they're really skilled at sort of making that work and they've adjusted to that but you know someone that is an amateur player that might not have the perfect putting stroke or the most repeatable putting stroke is is going to immediately kind of fall into the the technology here um of of absolutely you know, the line and and, and, and not everyone, people, you know, people do need to make adjustments. I mean, there's, um, I love reading through the threads like on WRX and, and Golf Spy and, and just watching people's journeys because the, the minute you take one back, you can definitely feel that something's different. Like, I don't care who you are. Like if you go to a superstore or Golf Galaxy and you just start swinging one back and forth, it's like, that's definitely different. Um, and listening to people's journeys on how they utilize that, how they accommodate that is different for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. some people struggle with distance at first because the brain registers torque as weight. And so when you take the torque away, the putter feels like it's in no man's land. Um, other people struggle from short range. The reason most people struggle from short range with our stuff is, is that particularly with our bigger models, that putter is working harder than any putter ever in history to go where you point. So if your aim is crappy, you're going to putt crappy. Um, and so we'll, we'll, you know, get these emails like, ah, like the feel distance control is good, but I am missing everything inside of 10 feet to the left and uh it's a funny when people have a singular miss because a singular miss is so much more frustrating than kind of every mm -hmm. putt being a new adventure but a singular <laughs> right. miss is actually a good thing because um singular probably miss an alignment fix or something 90 percent of the time yeah right uh yeah that's wow so this is fascinating and 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 now one more question before I kind of want to get uh, back into in some of the chat questions that we've received here. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted, because we're so fitting oriented here at Second Swing, and we obviously encourage everybody um, to get their putter fit for their putting stroke. And then, of course, um, if you're going to get through a lab putter in the bag, also go get that fit. But um, in terms of the, the the specs and sort of the how unique you know the builds are and, and things are a little bit different than quote unquote standard in the industry, right? So can you maybe speak to just some of the... Um, the differences in sort of your maybe standard specs and what maybe people should look for there. Um, obviously the broomstick is very different with a very kind of that different lie angle. Um, can you just speak to the difference there and how important it is to make sure these are actually fit for you? Yeah, so I'll start with the broomstick actually. So brooms are actually the easiest to fit. Um, they, you know, like I said, Adam's like big time outlier as far as where his lie angle is. Everybody who uses a broomstick, the idea is to get the shaft as upright as is humanly possible. Mm -hmm. The legal limit is 80 degrees. Ours come in at like between 79.5 and 79.8 just to leave a, you know, extra room for a crappy uh, uh, law fly machine somewhere. Um, and the rest after that is just figuring out length. Everything else is fixed. The loft is fixed. The shaft clean is fixed. Um, 
and so what we tell people to do, especially most of whom are, are first time users of a broomstick, grab your three wood, grab your driver um, and kind of just get into what, you know, whatever kind of posture you feel you're going to use to move the broomstick um, to help you ballpark a good length. So, yeah, broomsticks are super simple. Um, the conventional putters are, are, are not. Um, uh, that's actually not true. They are super simple, but it's a little bit more involved in the broomstick. Um, with the conventional putters, we really needed to prioritize fitting um, early on because the only model we had was the directed force. And directed force is a monster and it's center shafted. So if you're a bit heel up or a bit toe up with that thing, you're really going to struggle because the length heel to toe is such that, you know, if you're on a slope or something, you, you can literally yeah. scrape the putter, you know, scrape the heel or the toe on the ground. So we needed that thing laying flat. Um, Bill invented both the remote fitting, which is incredibly accurate and very easy, um, as well as the fitting tool, which, you know, you guys have that adjustable, um, uh, putter that, you know, can be lefty righty goes from, I think 60 degrees lie angle all the way up to, you know, max lie. So, uh, and they're fun to mess around with too, because you can, with such a big range, you know, like there's no, you've, no, no, there's no store that has a an answer style putter that's bent down to 65 degrees. Like it just wouldn't happen at the same time. I'm sure everybody listening has a friend that putts with the toe three inches in the air, you know, <laughs> and uh, you know, very few people actually lay the putter down flush. Um, and so uh, to have the opportunity to so easily accommodate the huge range of ways that people want to set up that, the general equipment standards just simply won't allow them to is awesome. And I talk about toe up guy all the time. I love toe up guy, you know, because they, <laughs> they um, you know, grip it in their fingers, and their hands are real low and, you know, they've always fought crappy strikes and, um, you know, needing to accommodate too much loft on their putters because now the loft is, the lie is screwing up, you know, launch direction and all that stuff. And, um, you know, and we can make anything. My favorite story um and this happened really early on um there was a guy up in bend um uh and i got a call from the pro up there and he he said you know i've got this guy um and he's just he's absolutely crazy about the game plays every single day can't break 100. um he's got this ping answer putter i bent it as flat as it'll go we do a putting lesson and he's still got the toe you know three inches up in the airs or you know anything you guys can do to help him we go up and fit him and the dude actually fit into 58 degrees which we we couldn't do we didn't have enough there wasn't enough wow. material on the head to grab a shaft coming in at that at that lie angle um so we made it at at, at 61 degrees which it, it's difficult to picture but it's absurd i mean it's an absurd putter <laughs> to hold um and uh and uh dude had had never broken a hundred and he ended up breaking 94 times that summer, you know, wow. just because he finally had something he could lay down and, and was comfortable with. And, um, so yeah, the, the fitting is great and it's wonderful. The range that we have to be able to accommodate anybody. Yeah. I, it, it is fascinating. We all, our fitters always like to say, you know, it, it, if you're going to get any club in your bag fit and you're, you know, you're going to pick one club, it's got to get fit. It's got to be the putter because you use the putter for 40% yeah. of your shots. And so someone like that, you know, that individual, who is struggling to break 100, you know, you optimize the putter a little bit, and that's, I mean, almost half of their shots on the round. And so then all of a sudden that quickly can drop down to breaking 90, which is uh, fascinating and, and really fun. And people, especially up in that handicap range, three putt a lot. You can start yeah. to take some of those away really easily. I'll tell you another good kind of extreme fitting story. Um, this is one of my favorites. So there's this guy, West St. Clair, that plays at our club. Um, his uh, son, Justin, was an All-American at U of O. And Wes is, uh, he's a trucker, just this gruff, surly old guy. And um, um, I mean, he kicks my butt all over the golf course every time we play. He just has this psychotically good short game, knows his game, plays this awful 40-yard hook on every single shot <laughs> and just knows how to get the ball in the hole. So when we came uh, to Crestwell and he started, you know, tinkering around with these putters, and he's always messing with putters and he's got the yips bad, but he manages them very, very well. And he knows that he's got them and he knows how to kind of just fight it out. So uh, he kept asking me to make them. He, he grips it. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this, but so he's got the right hand on top conventionally and then it, he's left hand low claw, but he kind of grips it like a cigar like this. Interesting. And, um, <clears throat> And he always wanted me to make him a really upright putter. 
And, you know, so we started at like 72. And we're like, eh, the heel's still off the ground. And we did it at 74. Then we did one at 76. It's like, I want you to make it as upright as you possibly can. I'm like, Wes, you're going to hate it. I promise. It's just <laughs> like conventional putting at 79 and a half degrees is just, it's just not good. Eventually, he goes around my back and he, he talks to the, the tour guy, Liam, who I mentioned before, and he asked Liam to build him this putter at, at 79.5 degrees. And I show up one Saturday morning. I'm looking for a game. And Wes is there. And he's like, you got a game? And I was like, no. He's like, well, you're playing with me. I'm going to show you why you're a crappy fitter. And <laughs> sure enough, he's got the 79.5 degree putter and the thing's standing straight up pretty much. And he went around that day in 18 putts. It is the first and only really? time I am sure ever see that in my entire life he chipped in once and he two putted once um and he shot 65 67 something something incredible and care, bear in mind this is a 64 year old guy playing from 6700 yards um and absolutely mopped the floor wow. with me and we were all watching him and talking about it you know like you're through tw 12 holes and he's got 12 putts and we start talking about it and he's still making them and it came down to 18 he had a 25 footer on 18 was in the second it left the face and then just very quickly to wrap the story up um because he has yeah just such an awesome dude i was i was texting with um brad faxon later that night and um and i texted brad and i was like you know talking about other stuff and i was like hey by the way i played with somebody today that had 18 putts you ever had 18 putts you know and this is arguably the greatest putter in the history of golf and he's like, I've had 19 a few times, but never 18. Who was that? And I was like, nobody, you know, a guy named Wes. And he's like, give me his number. So I'm like, all right. So I, I give Brad Fax and Wes's number. Brad puts us on a group text and says, you know, hey, Wes, just, you know, my name's Brad Fax and I've been playing professional golf for 35 years. And I just, you know, I'm, or 50, whatever, however many years. And um, I've never had 18 putts before. I just wanted to say congratulations. And um, I'm thinking Wes is going to be blown away that Brad Faxon's texting him, you know, late in the right. evening. And he's like, I missed a lot of greens. Thanks. Have a good night. And that was it. <laughs> uh, I can't tell if that's humble or if that's like sh in showboating at the same time. I don't, I don't know. That's, that's pretty good. I think it was an accidental flex, which is pretty much yeah. Wes's whole existence. That, that's good. That's awesome. What a story. Jeez. Uh, okay. Uh, we are, we are kind of going a little bit low on time here. So I, I did want to get to some of the questions that have been submitted in the chats. There's been some really good ones and we also appreciate everybody for, for joining and, and throwing those comments in there. I can't get to all of them obviously. Um, but um, one I did want to get to here was from Andrew S said, uh, Sam, can you touch on the counterbalance builds? Um, does the shaft have some forward lean since they don't have uh, the press grip? Great question. So uh, they have a tiny bit, um, about a quarter of a degree between a quarter and a half degree is the, is the tolerance there. Um, uh, but yes, definitely less um, and very astute point. Yes. So they, they have less shaft lean, um, the longer grip. And so they function m much more similarly to some of the um, other counterbalances that you see out on the market. However, our putters are on set. The reason for the shaft lean and for the press grip is to mitigate onset. It's to get your hands back out over or even in front of the face. So when you take away the lean and take away the press grip, you now have a face that's in front of the hands. And so as people start to, um, you know, experiment with these counterbalance putters, it's imperative that they keep the ball very far forward um, so that the, the face isn't getting to the ball too quick. And it's worth considering um, how much onset you want. And so the two models that we offer in counterbalance is going to be the DF3, which has significantly more onset um than the sure. mes max so sure. um yeah great question okay nice nice that's 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 an important component to you know all these different putter builds that are that are becoming popular nowadays um here's a different one different uh topic but certainly uh, something of interest here from tyler uh said he, he did miss the first 30 minutes so he's not sure if this was discussed i don't believe it was um are there any new link head covers in the works any other extra sweetheart head covers available um I don't know how much he's going to like me just blowing up his email on a YouTube thing, but email Carter at labgolf.com about the sweethearts. <laughs> I'm not sure what, uh, what ended up happening with those. Um, that was just kind of a bummer. Honestly, we wanted to do all that for Valentine's day and they came out orangish instead of pinkish. So, um, but they're really cool. Um, and then yes, we are going to um, over the course of this summer, going to be releasing quite a few. Um, we've got some lab Very stuff cool. in the works. We've got some all leather ones in the works. Um, so yeah, for sure. 
Sweet. Yeah, those things, those, those unique cover covers are always really cool. Um, all right, we got one here from Trenton. Um, we'll kind of wrap it up with this one from Trenton. Any big plans after the DF3? Do you plan on always keeping all the models? Example, the 2.1 is always going to be around. Um, does that hold true for some other, well, does that hold true for these other models? Um, the 2.1 will absolutely be around exactly as is in the form that it is. That's our, that's our baby. It's our logo. It's our putter. Um, uh, the other ones will start to probably see some evolution. The Mez is an extraordinary putter, but you know, over the years we've, we've definitely seen enough pictures of, of people cutting open their shins with those sharp edges. And, um, <laughs> there's some improvements we can make on, um, other aspects of it. So yeah, we'll, we'll continue to evolve them as best we can. Um, and also keep coming up with new shapes. It is my hope to keep all everything in in production i always wondered especially when you got a winner why it ever comes out of production like the i remember thinking this with the titleist ap2s like they were the most perfect club like why screw with it why change it why do anything with it um and uh so yeah that's our hope um obviously inventory management is a thing and you don't want to you, yep. you know it's difficult to have too many skews but um, at least for the time being while we have to go really slow to design a putter it's not as though we can design 15 shapes and then just kind of poop them out, you know, we're going to be going one at a time here for a while. So I think it'll be a long time before we start taking stuff out of production and we will absolutely be introducing more over the years. Very cool. Very cool. Um, I think that's a very pleasing answer for a lot of the lab golf fans that are watching this. So um, I'm going to wrap it up there, Sam. I know we've got, um, you got, you got places to be, we've got things to do too. And, um, but we had a really good session here, really just a ton of information, some cool stories from you as well. So um Golfers that are watching, uh, please check out the selection of lab putters on secondswing.com. Um, try out the, the Mesmax broomstick or the directed force, uh, any of the, the lab putters. Um, and if you're, you might be struggling with your game and you've been using a kind of quote unquote standard model for, for the longest time, maybe try something new. Um, and so, uh, all this information today from Sam could maybe help you with that decision. So, uh, Sam. Thank you so much for your insight, your stories. Um, this was this was fantastic. Drew, my pleasure. It was a lot of fun.